Okay, let's get a move on, in case we run over time. Welcome to my talk, Managing APIs in Enterprise Systems. So this is going to be a talk about the using as opposed to the designing of APIs. My name is Pete Muldoon and uh, I work in Bloomberg. I'm a software architect lead. And uh, outside of the name, who am I? Okay, I started using C++ professionally in 1991, which was back in the very, very early days. Uh, as a professional career, I've been a system analyst and architect. I was 21 years as a consultant, which just meant that I've seen a lot of different companies, a lot of different things that went on inside of them. And currently I've been with Bloomberg roughly the last 10 years. And these days I lead the Bloomberg, the Bloomberg ticker plant Linux migration effort, which is taking a large um, system which has a lot of legacy characteristics and moving it over from uh, the old big iron systems to Linux where we get a lot of advantages in power and latency. Okay, what I like to do when I'm at a conference though is give a talk focus on the practical engineering, real world problems and real world solutions. I don't like taking theory and saying here's what I think would happen. I like to have it proved out in the real world. And I hope at the end of a talk, you take something away that you can use, not that it's sort of very esoterical and you're saying, well, that was a great talk, now let me just do everything. I used to do the exact same way I used to do it, all right? So if you have questions in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a slide number. If you can use that, it makes it easy to go back to a slide if you have a question on it. And I will be taking breaks periodically and asking for questions. All right, so where will we be going with this talk? All right, this talk will be about using APIs in applications, not, not uh, designing them. And the talk is based on some real world work I did about, at this stage, about a year and a half ago. Um, so everything you see is real, right? Some of it has been simplified down because we have to do slideware, but it is based on a real production system. Um, it was a complete rewrite of a system, so it, uh, it took the hard road of instead of just trying to increment to take a real big jump and it used a lot of solid engineering practices. Um, my participation happened after this had started, so there, I'm going to show you how the system was set up initially and what design decisions were made. Some I agreed with, some I did not agree with. Um, there could have been other paths to get to the same destination. There may be better, maybe not. And I will debate some of that as we're going through this talk. But my main focus in this talk will be handling change in a production system. Now what that means is it's a system that is fault intolerant. I don't have the latitude to take a couple of shots at getting this right. I can't have the system brought down. There's going to be big consequences, right? I work in Bloomberg, if we mess this up, it's a trading system, money goes the wrong way, we can be sued, we can be fined by the SEC, we can have all kinds of bad things happen, right? Reputational damage in the marketplace. So we have to have a, a good way of mitigating risk when we do change in production. Let's talk about enterprise systems, right? Big, large, sprawling systems. They use many APIs. So when I go to put an application together, I don't want to write all the code from scratch, I'm going to have APIs to take, third-party APIs to take care of various bits and pieces. For instance, I need to do a database, I don't want to write my own. I'll use Sybase, Cassandra, something like this. I'll have another API maybe for fast cache access. I want to have uh, the ability to get some data very quickly. I'll have some IPC to, to communicate with other services or communicate effects outside the company, like down to clearing, down to the DTC. And I'll do function, there's various libraries that'll give me functionality, right? You guys, are, you know, you write these things or you see talks on them. And like I say, these things provide my, the ability in my system to get referential information. So when I get some action that comes into my system, it's just like, it's got handles to stuff. In my case, it will be what security you're trading, who is the client who's wants to do the trade, who's the broker that's gonna satisfy it. There's a whole bunch of referential information we pull in all right, and once we get that, we have to have persistence because once I do these trades, they have to be persisted that if I go down and come back up, I still have the same state, preserved state. And like I say, side effects get propagated down, right, or out to other systems that will take actions based on these. 
So let's talk about APIs. Um, when I go to put a talk together, I go out there and see who's covered this ground before, make sure I'm not just duplicating what something else did. So I went out and looked for API talks at conferences, right? And here's what I got, right? It's a lot of talks out there about how to do the best API design, how to make an API that works well, an API that uh, there's uh, workshops at CPP cons. So it's a very big field. A lot of people doing this thing. Uh, I don't want to cover that, right? I want to cover it on the consumer side of taking this thing. So if you are a producer of an API, and again, you've seen all the talks and there's a bunch of the literature, I'm not going to go over. I'm going to give you some points that I think make a good API when you're designing it, right? So it should be of general use and flexible. That means you have a wide application base, so you can sell it to lots of people, right? Many available modes of operation, so you can handle a lot of different cases of how this thing is done. All right. Again, it makes it used in a lot of places. Um, and at this, you know, at this stage of the game, we should also have <clears throat> some requirement that there's testability. So if I'm using the API, do I have sort of mocks that are available that I can do dependency injection and check that it's doing the correct thing, without me having to test it in production? All right. And then good ergonomics and documentation, meaning that you know, it's easy to use, intuitive how you use, and it's not like you got to do a lot of very strange things that people won't know what's going on. But as a user of an API, so I am now the consumer side of this, what am I looking for in an API? Well, I'm looking for it to handle my specific use case. I want constrained modes of it being used. I don't want to see everybody doing the same kinds of operations in 20 different ways because it's got a very wide API that it can do it. So I want it very narrow so things are done in a particular way and follow a particular uh, design patterns and stuff that I'm looking to do. I also want, like I said, constrained modes because if you, know, if you can do it in 10 ways, over time 10 ways will we'll, we'll have it done. My people do it different way each time. And then we get code efficiency and bundling. And what that means is just that there's certain operations we're always going to do before we save something to the database, before we send it out. We can just bundle up that as part of, let's say, the send or the uh, save the database routine. Now, if you look at the producer and consumer, the first two points, they're going in opposite directions. Or the producer wants a very general use API so everyone can use it. And me, as a system designer, want something that's very constrained so it's used in a particular way. All right, so they kind of go the other, the other the opposite direction. So how do I make those two things meet? I usually have an abstraction. And that abstraction will constrain the interface that's been used at the top. All right? So if I look at my system, and this is a very, very uh, crude map of a system, I have users sending me in actions. I have outside information I pull in as referential data. I, inside my application, I mutate state. I do operations. And then I save that state to the database, and then I send out the effects downstream or to the next system on in, in the line. All right. Like I say, normally the output of one system goes into the input of the other system, either inside your company or outside of it. Right? You'd probably be part of a pipeline. But I'm just going to look at the part of the system that I'm interested in and to, to demonstrate some of the things I'm trying to get across today. So what I'm going to take is just a very simple slice of the full system. I'm going to say that inside my system, actions come in, I do these operations, and then the result of that is sent out as a request to a downstream system, and they send me back some response, probably of how well it went or some kind of ID of that system of where that operation is, you can track it. All right. So there'll be many inputs and outputs in a functioning system, but I just want to concentrate on this one. Let me get rid of everything else. All right. So where I am in Bloomberg, we have a comms API. I changed the name to make it more intelligible. But I have this comms API that takes a request type and a response type. Okay. And that just means the request and response are generated elsewhere. They can be all, you know, very rich, uh, tapestry of request responses. And this thing has a send that's blocking, where I send a request, I get a response back and blocking. And it also has an async version. 
where it just sends you back, did the operation pass or fail? And what happens is it takes a callback object, which has to have a particular um, signature on its parens operator, and it'll pass you back, among other things, their version of a unique pointer, which has the allocated memory of what, right, what the response was. Okay, so they're doing some allocation of this or pulling it out somewhere, and they hand back you this pointer that says this is where the memory is. They're not using unique pointers because it's an older API. All right. So, oh, and it's very wide. This thing here has a send, but it has a send one way, meaning you just want to send it. You don't care if it got there or not. You have a send one way with ACK, which means you send it, and you don't care about the result of the operation, you just care it got, it got to where it needed to go. It can do different types of encoding, bear, XML, JSON, and um, it can take structured data or blobs. So it's a very wide general interface that I really don't want to open up to the guys in my system. So I'm going to do a wrap around this. All right. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to call my wrapper service because that's what we did. And uh, I think the, the API I have in request and response as templated uh, class types is a good way to go. So we have a send function that takes a request and returns a response. Now, in the system I was in, which was meant to be highly parallel and a lot of data flowing through it, we wanted to take control of people copying data. So we didn't want copies done willy-nilly. We wanted to control the copying. All right. So we decided, and I have no way of saying that the request that's used here is the template parameter. That's generated someplace else. I have no control. I can't say, don't give me a request that's copyable. They're all going to be copyable. But in our system, we want to impose this constraint. So what is a way I could prevent people copying the response? So I'm going to put the response inside of this thing called a carrier. How am I going to stop it from being copied? Delete the copy constructor. All right. Someone said they can delete the copy constructor. Yeah, and I can write the move constructors, right? I'm going to have to write move constructors. Maybe handle the memory management because I'm going to have this pointer. I'm going to handle the memory management myself and on destruction, I'll get rid of the memory, right? Who thinks that's a good idea? Who thinks it's a bad idea? This looks like everyone doesn't know. It's a terrible idea, all right? Because <laughs> we've, pro we've proven in the past we don't do this well, right? Ownership, it's where most of our problems go into ownership of memory. So what's another way of making sure we can't copy the response. Anyone? Maybe the response doesn't contain the data. Just uh, it's in requested. It? Yeah, but then I'm still managing the data. So here's the way you do it, right? We use a unique pointer. The language has given us a unique pointer to denote ownership and say we don't have to worry about the memory management anymore. All right. And some people say, oh, that's an extra allocation. It's not because I'm just going to take the allocated memory that's in this faux unique pointer from days gone by and put it into this one here. All right, so now I've taken control of the response. If you try and, like, there's many, many instances you say, oh, we can always spot copies. I don't think you can. I know I can't, right? It's insidious. You throw copies into a vector and you said, yeah, they've got move semantics, so they'll move. Turns out you didn't put no except on the constructor, so it copies them anyway. So this thing here, the compiler will tell you if you try and copy. And if you really need a copy, you'll have to work at it. But if you really worked at it, I'm pretty sure you needed it. Okay? So now I have, the other thing I want to do is make this non-blocking. Right? So I had callbacks before, but we've kind of moved in a different direction these days. How, what's the way we do asynchronous operations these days? Futures, that's right. All right, well, I'm going to change the uh, below to get the response. We're going to put the response carrier inside a future. So now what I have is something that's asynchronous. I can take that future, and it's only when I say the get on this future, right, that I actually will go into a blocking, blocking mode or wait around. Now, the system I was working in had its own coroutine, li a coroutine library. I think it was a lot saner than what I see in the standard coroutines. And it was stateful, so coroutines could call it coroutines. All right. So we had to do, deal with a lot of parallelism. And this, we decided the future promise model was going to be most familiar and comfortable with people coming from 
you're in modern C++, so that's the way we, we had it. So we've taken a older API that has its own version of unique pointer, a very wide contract you can do um, uh, and, and, and copy all day long, and it had callbacks, and we made it into a modern constrained API where you can't copy the data, and you're going to be forced to do asynchronous communication. All right. All right, so now that I have that, I want to create a service that's going to use this. So, and, and by the way, that um, uh, service I just put together wasn't just for this slice. That was used everywhere throughout the enterprise system. So anytime anyone was sending something anywhere, they used that abstraction. All right, so I have a service. Now all I have to do is say, you know, give myself an alias. I have a service A now, which is just request and response A. And in the main, I'm just going to create one of these things. So I create this in the main, like I say, because we had to worry about lifetimes with coroutines. We created our services in main, then we spun up coroutines, spun them down, and then we exited main, so we didn't have any lifetime problems. And error handling. So they had a way of doing error handling, and like I say, I didn't come on at the beginning, which I didn't particularly like, but it did work. And what they did was they had these functions that checked the response and said, look, if it, if it doesn't throw an exception, it's the happy path. All right, so that's how they did error handling. And this is, for the most part, there's, you know, there's only one of these. There's only one service, that H, one main, one error handling. But on the other side, I have a lot of different actions that have to be done, a lot of different trade types that get created, a lot of the actions on these trades. So we have, I'd say tons, but like many, many, many of these application handlers. I'm just gonna take a generic one and call it Action X Handler. And what it has is it has a service inside of it, and when someone puts in, uh, says I need an action done, we create a request, we do a bunch of logic to fill that request, going, mutation, uh, getting extra data elsewhere. And then what's going to happen is we're going to call a service A and do a send on it with that request and get the future back. All right, so it's async. So we don't have any blocking going on here. And then I say, look, I want my result by just resolving what's in the future. If there's nothing there, I block. Otherwise, there'll be an exception in there, or there'll be a response in there, right? Anyone see any problem with this as being like parallel processing? All right. Some people say, how can this be parallel when you got a future and immediately resolve that future? That sounds like you're going to block. Well, the thing is, as requests come into the system, they're put into their own coroutine. So even where I block here on the get, all right, it's going to put this in a halt state. We're going to go and get another request. So it's, the, the system's still busy as long as there's stuff coming in. And every time a promise gets its, uh, gets its value set or an exception put on it, right, it gets woken up next time when the scheduler puts it on. All right, and so we have a large throughput of, of requests coming through the system. But again, there's many and many of these. And then I'll do a check response. So this is a, the basic handler, all right? I'll get something, uh, block on it, get the response, everything will be fine. Now for testing, and this, this system did things right in that uh, the authors of this thing said, anytime you do a change, put in a pull request or a change request, you're gonna have to have a test that goes with it. So we had our testing. So how are we gonna do the test? We use mocks. I hope everybody here is familiar with mocks because all my testing is going to be using mocks. What we do here is we inherit from the base class, which will be a service A or a service B or wherever it is. And then what we're going to do is call, have a send function that returns a future with a carrier in it. All right. And then I'm going to put the mock method in here, which the calling function will put in. And all this is said is there's going to be an unsend function and it's going to have the signature of taking a STD future carrier pointer or returning it when we take a request. And that was just to get around unique pointer needing to be copied, right? We didn't want to copy it. So if we look at this thing here, we have uh, in the service, you see the send method. 
all right, that takes the request and returns the future. If I have a mock version that inherits from that, and I put that version inside of my handler, what's going to happen when I call send? Right, it's going to call this version of send. So I need dynamic dispatch. So I got to put virtual in front of it. Now sometimes people go, oh my God, you're putting a virtual function, you're accessing the table. I see Vittorio smirking over there. But uh, it, you know, you can do it other ways. There is, you can do like a, a static polymorphism and do tricks and stuff that you don't have to get this call. But it wasn't a problem for us doing it this way. It was the easiest way. It was the most obvious way. And until it's a problem, I don't want to optimize for something that's not a problem. All right. So I need the dynamic binding. So getting back to the testing, I have my action handler. And all I'm going to do is say, look, I'm going to create a handler fixture, right? And all I'm going to say is it has a mock service. The first line, we create a mock service based on service A. And I'm going to take my action handler and initialize it with the mock, not the real one. And then the execute is just there, so I keep it out of the uh, various functions that I'm going to run in it, right? It's just going to call handler execute when I drop an action into it. So remember, in this situation, we have two things coming out of the function. Like if this was just, I don't know, double a number, I could put something in, look at the output, and that would be it. It would be fine. But here I have a hidden piece sent out. So I drop an action in, and then a response comes back out. But the main meat of what's going on is the request that's been sent downstream. Is that configured correctly? Does that got the proper data in it? So I need to get my hands on that. All right, so that's what you want to do in testing. So here's how we do it. We have, uh, we're doing one of these uh, test fixtures in Google Mock. We make a, a request at the, at the beginning. I'm going to build myself some kind of action. Here I'm going to build myself an action that uh, causes a problem, gives me back a bad response. All right. And then I'm going to say, look, I want a future with this response inside of it, because that's what the, um, what the mock function says is going to return. And then the first line that's highlighted in blue says, I'm going to expect a call to service A on send function. And whatever it is you get, I want you to save that argument, which will be the request that's been populated and all the internals inside of the handler. And I'm going to put it into the local variable request here. And after that, I can take a look at it if I need to. Here, because this is going to throw an exception when it hits the check response that's buried inside of the execute, I say expect to throw. For the other, I guess the happy path, we're going to create a, a, a better action, right? something that we know what's going, it's going to succeed. We're going to send back a response, or a, a future with a response inside of it. And what we're going to say is expect this thing, the same expect call as before, except this time when we run it, we're not going to throw. And we're going to be able to start looking at the request. Is the quantity correct? Is uh, various IDs incorrect in it? Right? They can examine the request and make sure it's correct based on the action I put in there. And the order, um, you see here those two lines at the end. So inside of um, unit testing, people can get tricky. They can have back doors. They can reach inside the state machine. So this is a way of them reaching inside to the transaction handling and saying, did we create the order correctly? All right, so this is kind of, I guess, what you call the white box testing. Any questions on what we've done so far? All right, so we took an API, constrained it, we showed how we use it in a, a part of a system. All right. So this goes into production, works well, and time goes by in production as it, as it will. More and more customers being pulled over to this brand new system. It's getting more and more critical that it stay up and be reliable. But change is in the air, all right? Because new business, new requirements are going to come along. It's going to try and bend your system out of truth. All right? I mean, theoretically, APIs stay stable. But I'm going to show you a case where the APIs all stayed stable. But because of my changing requirements, I had to do a large change in the code. What was the requirements change? Well, I'll, I've changed the names, but essentially service A is going to be replaced by service B. And why are we doing this? Well, it's going to be more direct. We've got better throughput, better latency, less points of failure. There's a whole host of wins we're going to get if we move to this other service. All right. 
And even if we say we don't care, management upstairs is saying you have to do it, right? Because of all these things here. It's gonna make us more competitive. So new, the service V that we were gonna be using was a very established service, but our connection to it was not. And they were gonna to have to do some minor building out, which was somewhat experimental, all right? So graphically to say what we were going to do, here's what we had before. We have a request coming out to service A, we get a response, and that's how we're doing it. We're gonna put in a new service that we're gonna send the request to service B. We're gonna get a different response back because it's a completely different service, all right? And we just wanna have it that we're running through service B because service A is now, we wanna deprecate it and get it out of there. So how do we do this? Okay, well, let's do it the easy way. So right now I have a check response for response A. Let me put one in for response B. It's a completely different response, different fields, whatever. So I'm gonna put something in that if it looks good, it doesn't throw. And then I'm just gonna change the service A's to service B. So I'll just change the alias, change the type. Down in the action handler where we have a service A, I'm just gonna put a service B. And then, as you see, I changed the name from service A to service B. That's something you should do. Um, any good IDE will handle this as opposed to trying to say, well, just leave all the names the same. Uh, you know, I've been in a system where I've gone in and seen something that has the database, database underscore, and it turned out to be doing MQ. And apparently in the early days, they put the data into a database table and something else read it out. That was their form of early inter-process communication. And when they went to MQ, they decided it would be much more easier not to change names, right? But it was very surprising to find something called database doing MQ operations. Anyhow, I digress. Um, so this is happening, um, right? I get rid of service A, or the response A, because I'm deprecated out of the system. And uh, I'm done. Wouldn't new service also require new request format? It, it, a very simple request change, but for the purposes of this here. Inside your implementation of the service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was hidden inside. So it just the same request, the request didn't change. All right, so the question was, does it not take a different request? And the thing is, for the purposes of this, no, it didn't. There was a slight transformation, and I will get to that nearer the end of the talk to show you what really was going on. But for now, this is for demonstration purposes, how we done. But are we done right now? Who here thinks, you know, the talk is over, let's go home, uh, let's go get uh, snacks, right? If you're in an environment where this is a fault intolerant environment where you can't take five or six shots at something, rather if it going wrong is not a big deal, then this will work. But in the environments I'm generally in that are fault intolerant, if I take production down, right, by doing something like this, um, my head will, I don't know if it'll roll, but I'll certainly get a lot of grief for it, all right? This approach is risky, because if I find out that, oh, you know, uh, service B has real big problems, and the team that owns Service B says, we're not going to get to that for six months. I can't leave my service down. i got to back all the changes out. Maybe there's other changes that went in in the meantime that will get backed out as well. So this approach is risky. And even if your Service B is a very well-established and proven process, which it may well be, so this has been around forever, stable as all hell, your interaction with this new service is definitely unproven. And you have no idea if it's going to work out or not. Okay? So straight swap is out in fault intolerant environments. So we can't do it this way. At least I can't. So what I really want to do is some more of a phased approach. Where I'm going to say, look, I'm going to put in service B. And for a segment of time, we'll talk about how long, there's going to both be there coexisting in the system. And at the beginning, I'm going to put a trickle of small clients through it. I'm gonna, you know, not the unimportant guys, just the low volume guys, because everyone's important. But over time, I'm gonna move more and more of my uh, volume down into service B, and probably have to do changes or fixes or fix bugs, but I'm able to handle them in a, in a, in a way that's not big bang, right? That everything just explodes on me. And over time, when nothing is going through service A, I will just get rid of it. So this portion here, the getting rid of it, is also what we do poorly. 
right? Everyone says, here's a new way of doing something. And they, half, they put half the traffic through it and go, oh, the rest is kind of difficult. Or I did it, I got myself to where I'm using the new service, but it's a nightmare. It's actually more risky to decommission the old stuff that's there because the system is fragile. So how, what have I done? You know, I haven't done a good job. That's what I think. And this phasing can take years. So if I do the brute force approach, and I've seen it done this way, I'm not going to say where, I've been around a lot of places, but instead of doing it the, uh, you know, the straight swap way, all I'm going to do is say, let me duplicate service B. Got my nice alias, uh, no big deal, in my main, put in a service B. Uh, have a checked response for B. So this is all going on in the left side, which is one version. So I don't mind doing this. This will be fine. However, on the right hand where I have tons and tons of my handlers, I now have to add in a service B. And I have to say, look, um, I'll have myself a route function. It's not interesting. Don't focus on it. All of this does is said, where is this thing going? And if it's going to a particular uh, destination, which it'll be a broker, some broker ID, then if that matches on a list, send it through service B, otherwise send it through service A. So it's just a mechanism for saying what goes where. Very quick, very efficient. Uh, it's a runtime check, but it's very quick, so uh, there was no need to optimize on this. How do people feel about this solution? There's, there's people waving their hands like this. All right. All right. There's a problem. There's a couple of problems. I don't know if anyone wants to shout out any problems they see, but the ones I see is that I have gone in and I will, in hundreds of handlers, have to add this new service. And then I have to put these, this branching statement in here. And then when I go to decommission, I have to undo all of this in hundreds of places. Now you say, look, I'm a patient guy, I can do it. Uh, we got lots of manpower, this isn't a worry for us. But what I can tell you is if you think this decommissioning happens two months after you put it in, at least where I am, you're sadly mistaken. All right? Because over time, these two forks are gonna get different. People are gonna make changes in one, to changes in the other. And when you come to decommission, you're going to say, these look like two different branches completely, not just two branches that are sending to different areas. And it becomes a nightmare to decommission it. So we leave it there and we go on our merry way and say, look, we got service A or service B in, we're fine. But it's a really bad practice of doing it that way because we don't think of the full scale or the full life cycle of what we're doing, which is not just getting service B up and running, but getting service A out. All right. And just to go back, I, I, I went and talked with my old manager who is, is still this, you know, leading this system and asked him, that change I did a year and a half ago, are you done with it? He said, I'm almost done with it. He said, there's one last broker where I have to keep this here and it's a different team, has to, they were doing something crazy, they have to undo that. But once that's done, yes we can undo it. So you can imagine leaving this code here for two years and no one touching it when it's, I don't know, a hundred files that are like this, right? Someone's going to go in and do stuff to it. So brute force is also out for me, at least for me. So what if I prioritize the migration path and by that I mean the full migration path? I look past just getting service B in, but to getting service A out. And I like to give myself some requirements. It's prevents me going off into the undergrowth and sort of, you know, vanishing into weird places when I do coding or design. So my requirements is I want to do, I want to localize meaningful changes. And what that means is any change that deals with what type of response comes back, how it's routed, all that stuff you've seen in the forks and stuff like that, that should be isolated into one spot, all right, which will probably be a new file. And then I want to uh, keep the global usage or the calling semantics the same. And for that I mean all the other places that call this code shouldn't have to change what they're doing. The meaning should stay the same. The send should be a send. The get should resolve a future. The, uh, the check should check the response. All right. It should all just, if you keep that contract, you won't have a sweeping change to all your code base. 
All right, if I do the brute force approach, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files change in all kinds of ways and people get nervous about it. I want to minimize the throwaway work, which is why I don't like adding all these extra variables and forks and stuff in the function. And I want to keep the final decommissioning simple. All right, which I say is something we forget, but that's what I'm trying to do. Now, when I did this, the one thing you have to look out for is unit testing. Because where I was, there was a very large body of it. Because like I say, they had this uh, procedure. You can't make a change without adding a test. And unit tests do all kinds of hairy stuff you would never allow in production. All, right. all manner of undefined behaviors, OK in there. Uh, very sketchy stuff, right? As long as you're sort of able to access some data. So. Um, it's very much less constrained in production. So you, you, know, you might think you're all done once you get the actual code done, but then the tests give you a nightmare. So you have to keep to the calling contracts there as well. And mocks may have additional semantics, they generally do, but I'll get into that later. So if I'm prioritizing the migration path, what do I want to do? Well, right, I just want to say, I want a service or a service-like object. I don't want to deal with service A, service B, service A. I'm just going to have something, I'm going to call it a service proxy. And that just means that um, I'm going to send stuff in the proxy and then I'm just going to have a check function on it. So it acts semantically like the first thing we were using, which is the service. All right. And then in the action handle, I'm just going to say, uh, I'll do that again. Uh, what happened here? All right. Yeah, there. So I'm going to change this service to a service proxy. And then instead of service.send, it's just going to be proxy.send. OK, so none of the calling code has changed. Now, I've changed the name of the variable, and I've changed the type, which I think you should do. You could get away with not doing it and just hide it under and say, service A actually now has a service B inside of it and all kinds of crazy stuff. But a decent IDE will do this. And when people see 100 files where all you're doing is a a replacement of service A for service proxy, they're not nervous about saying that's a safish change. Okay? So I have to design myself a service proxy that looks, acts, feels, smells just like the one I had. So what do I want to do? I don't even know what's supposed to be in this. So what do I need inside of this service proxy class? Two, no, you were right. Someone up here said two services, right? I need to be able to send either service A or service B. So they're the two members. Um, and what else do I need? Same thing feeling. That's right. I just need to say, listen, I got a send function just like the last one. So that inside my handlers, when it says proxy.send, right, it just works. So here it takes the request, does the routing in one spot. This is one file that all the handlers are going to uh, call. And I'm going to say, look, um, either send it down service A or send it down service B. And I get a var resp future back. What do people think a var resp future has inside of it? Like it's, uh, it's a variant. What are the two things inside of this variant? Future of A and a future of B. Right. OK, it's just whatever comes back from either one of these things. All right. So pretty elegant, pretty simple. I've just replaced my service with the service proxy. I said, this is elegant. I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm almost there to the home line. Start compiling. All right, and I get a problem. No member name get in the variant. And that's true. There's an STD get you can use on a variant, but that's a different show. If we go back to our handler code and we look at it, we can see that we used to return a future, which we could do future.get on. Now we're returning a variant of futures, and we can't do the get on it. But what is the semantic equivalent of doing a get on this variant? So let's say I'm going to have this result future. It's going to act a bit like the future we already had. What am I going to add to it? Two different methods for each type. No. A get, a get function. Mm -hmm. All right. Look, I have the variant coming back, so I can't give it a raw variant. So I'm going to put it in here, and I'm just going to put enough code in here to satisfy the contract and the handlers, which they call the get on it. So here's what my get looks like. All right. What is the get doing? Now, you see this thing called overloaded. All of this is is a variadic template that inherits from all the lambdas you give it. 
And it just means that when you use visit, it picks the right lambda. Right? I'll show you it in a second. You don't need that. I know you don't need it, but yeah, well spotted. But we used it, but that's what we used, right? So I would love to just erase history and say we didn't do this thing. This is what we used because we were not familiar with 17 at the time, all right? But you can see here that what is this thing semantically doing? When I get, when I run, do the get on it, before the get return me the response, what is the get going to return me now? The var resp. So what is this var resp? It's just a variant of the actual results. All right? So semantically the same. I used to do a get in the future and get the result. Now I do a get in a variant of futures to get a variant of results. Easy to reason about. Now, when I showed this at a conference, someone equally uh, sagacious, as our, my friend Vittori here, said, hey, why don't you use something else that makes it a lot easier? Oh, let me show you here. So this is just showing that we solved that contract. That's, what, that's where we were getting the problem. And then we do a get, the result is going to be the variant. Right? But someone said, listen, this is a bit too much. I was like, OK, well, here's what we were using. It's just, a, a, like I said, a variadic template. The only difference, I think, this and the one that's on CP P preference is that this has a deduction guide saying move everything because we're very move happy. Right? But if you look at this thing here, inside of both of these lambdas, it's doing the exact same thing. It's just the argument coming in is different. Right? So what would we use here instead? Were I a little more on my STD 17 game at the time? Right. Just a variadic or a generic lambda. I really don't care what's coming in. I just want you to call, all right? I just want you to call the, uh, the, the get on it and put it into the variant. So again, very simple, very elegant. I think I must be done right about now. Question? Wouldn't now the person calling get should, should make the, now they should get from the variant either this or that thing to indicate whether they're getting the service A query or service C query? No. No, I'll show you why, but no. Question was, don't we need to distinguish what's in the variant A? Is it the A or the B? No, we don't because we're going to let overloading and stuff handle that, so we don't have to do it ourselves. All right. Is everyone clear on this? So what we know just is we have a result future that just gets resolves the future, whatever one is, is, is inside of it. All right, so... Here's how it's going to look now. Instead of me returning that var s future, I'm just going to initialize the result future with it and send it back. And I say, OK, I think I'm done. Let it rip. <sighs> Another problem, right? Another calling contract problem. And these are the things you've got to iterate through. So this says there's no member name res pointer in the variant, which there isn't. Because remember, we would have normally resolved to the carrier, and we would have just gone into the unique pointer. Actually, I'll show you here, right? When we do the check response, we say, look, what I want you to do is go to the res pointer member variable, which is the unique pointer, and I want you to dereference that to give me what's inside the unique pointer, which is the response, and then that response gets dropped into the check response. Even explaining that feels awkward. So it's a clue that I, sh we probably, I was going to say I should probably not have done it this way, but I actually didn't do it this way. I just came in and had to clean up that it was done this way. So what do we do? Here is the root of the problem. Right? We did direct member access of res pointer. So we say, go into the res pointer and dereference it. Now, when I come back and say, I have to take my variant of actual, right, my var resp, which is the variant of either the carrier A, carrier B, to solve this particular spaghetti down here, I have to say, okay, I gotta have a res pointer member. So let me solve that problem. So I solve that problem. And now I gotta be able to dereference it and get the actual variant back out. Okay, I gotta put these in. Okay, who thinks, who likes to look at this? Who thinks this is the way to go? Who thinks it's not the way to go? All right, people are saying in YouTube land, it's not the way to go. You're correct, this is horrible. And even if I'm saying I'm fulfilling the contract, someone's gonna come along afterwards and go, whoever wrote this has gone in the head. Like, why would he create like a res pointer from a this and that point? What is he doing? So this is bizarre, right? And it is. And what I wanna do is go back, and this is a place where I thought I needed to make a meaningful change. 
So I went back and I said, look, instead of going after the res point and all this thing, why don't I just add something that says what I'm actually trying to do? Get response. And that will take the whatever's in the pointer and hand it back as a, a const reference. Right? It's clearer to read. And if down the road I change something about what's in this class, this abstraction can absorb that change. And that's something I'm trying to make you see here is that abstractions aren't just for um, what we do is say like, you know, build up operations and sort of express intent. It also allows you to absorb change. So this allows, so if I do something like this, <clears throat> then what do I do here? Well, I'm going to change this to just get response. But look what's happened my result right now. It's simple, right? It just says, listen, if you want the response, just return the variant of the response. So that means now my check response is satisfied and everything is going to be hunky-dory. All right? Anyone have any questions on this? So what I've done is I've taken all that change that was going on, put it in a proxy class in one spot, I more or less had this thing not have to do any changes, which is in hundreds of places in my code. All right, so it's much safer change, I think. Okay, what about the result analysis? And that's what you were asking. So in my error handling, I have the check response to response A, right? I've wrote one for response B, right? I just need to write one for what comes back from the service proxy. And all of this does is it uses my old way of doing things. And I would like to be able to drop this particular slide from my presentation, but then I'm not being honest, right? Because this is how I did it at the time. And I've since left that project, but I feel like sneaking back and changing it to this, right? Much clearer, much simpler. Um, you lose a little bit of type checking, but I don't, I, I'm not worrying about that. So again, now what happens is when the response comes in, we do a check response. It just gets dispatched to whichever one is supposed to have it. Throw an exception or don't throw an exception. Could you please return to your action X handler? Okay, so here I would express, okay, this check response, mm -hmm. this check response for this action handler or for all the action handlers? All the action handlers have this. Okay, so I would imagine that for action X handler, if between the auto result line and the check response, or well, maybe after the check response, you would like to read from the result the, uh, the data you got, which is dependent on whether it's uh, result A or result B. The type is dependent on result A or result B because you sent a request, you want to mm -hmm. uh, read the response. Which I don't. I just want to know it was successful. Ah, that's always what... That's In this situation, that's what we wanted. There was other parts of the system where exactly okay, what you're so saying... So I'm talking about, about actions that are only sent. What you're talking about is we would do a check response and we would have further stuff below it, right? That would actually say, let me interrogate that response for maybe an ID that I want to put into my databases. It's an external transaction ID. There was stuff like that going on elsewhere in the system, but this was the part I was actually in, which was nice because it means I don't have to deal with the, but yeah, you can have a bunch of stuff after this that checks the response. It doesn't. Okay, but, but then because you, uh, because it matches yeah. the response. You would have further contracts now to, have to fulfill. Uh, yeah. Because of the yeah. Okay. Yeah. As I say, that was not my. That was that. Th th this is a real problem in the real world. So this is, this is how we solved it. If you have more down here, then yes, you have to start thinking about what's the contract being. And if it's a whole bunch of stuff, a thousand lines of code, you probably should have factored it into a function or two, right? And then that function can absorb the change as well, right? Just like the check response did. So I don't think it would be that hard to fix, but. Reality can bite. No, but you you probably have different ones for each hand for each action. Right, but it will still get dispatched the same way. Right, you'll have multiple check responses for different types of responses coming back. They have to be written anyway. You'll just be you'll just be diverting either one way or the other, the new response or the old response. So it's well within the ability to pull it into this paradigm. Anyway, let me get back to where I was. Okay. <clears throat> so what about testing? Does anyone know how we're doing for time? Ten more minutes. That's it? Oof. Okay. All right. Well, that's not so bad. I won't have to rush. 
So for, what do I do for testing? This is what my mock service test was like. So what is my proxy test like? It's actually simpler to look at, right? All I'm going to do is inherit from my service proxy, um, you know, which my service proxy will have, has the virtual in front of it, so I get the dispatch. And then all I'm going to say is, look, we're going to do the send, and I have the same mock method which says, look, you're going to get a const request reference and return me a result future pointer. That's it. And then when I go to do the actual testing, here if I want to test the, mocks, the, the mock uh, service itself, I didn't show you this the first slide, it's not very interesting. But look, I just change it to proxy, and then I say, listen, instead of returning where you see uh, the SD unique point, instead of returning a response, just return me a proxy response. That's it. Simple to do. Okay, where are you going? <laughs> Get back over there. <laughs> I dare you walk out my talk. <laughs> all right, so the handler that we have under test, all right, I have, look at it, I have a service A, service up here, and this is what we had, right? So we've already discussed that that's changed, but look at the bottom, we have mock service, uh, that's the M service, and then we have the action handler being in, um, initialized by it. We just changed that <clears throat> to a different type and just renamed the variable. That's it. All right. That's all you have to do. A good IDE will blow through 100 files. You push that in a PR. Look at this, look at this, look at this. It's the same, 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 same. You go, you just have to look at the service proxy, the hour handler, and main, and you can sample these all you want, right? And then when I go to the actual testing, just like this is the test from before, right? Exactly the same. The only difference is I'm going to have to return a different uh, response. So instead of building a response, all I'm going to do is build a proxy response. That's it. That's all the change I needed to test this. Let's look at the more interesting where we're testing the handler. That's just testing the service itself, testing the handler. Again, I have a request and I'm going to capture the output in at the top. I'm going to have an action that I build to do something. This thing I'm going to build so that it's a bad response. Um, so that's where I do the unique pointer for the response. I'll say expect the call to the on send. I want you to capture the request that's going out. I'll say expect a no throw when you do this action. And now look at the request quantity, look at the get order, look at whatever. All right, now, the change that happens watch carefully, is here. Just on, I need a different response, and I'm, I've changed the variable name. So again, this punishing change has been absorbed very handily in your code. Right? You've not changed how anyone is using this. You're changing behind the scenes in just one spot that it gets used, where it gets used, right? Um, so let's talk decommissioning. I hope we have a few minutes for that. Decommissioning, oh, question. So the question is, with our testing, do we have testing for service A and service B, or do we just say, hey, uh, we're looking at the, remember, we're not testing service A and service B here, we're testing service proxy. So if I have some dependency injection to the mock, or not the mock, to the route, I can somehow mock out the routing, then I can say, you know, as a parameterized test, run it where I flip it one way, flip it the other, and make sure we have the same kind of results. But I do want to get to decommissioning, because this is the part we have a really bad history of doing, all right? So here's what I had in my service proxy. So <clears throat> it's going to be easy to decommission the error handling, right? Delete request A. Uh, it's going to be easy in main, delete the instantiation of that object and the alias. So here's where I have my service proxy. So level one decommission I can do is I can just say, look, get rid of the service A. And if I don't have a service A, I don't have a route branch. Right? And if I don't have a route branch, I just have a variant with A in it, or with B in it, sorry. Right? So I can say, hey, I've gotten rid of A. A disappears completely from my system. It's completely gone now. When I have a service B, I have a variant with a future service B in it. Does that look odd to anyone? Anyone not like that? 
Yeah, that's the most problems I've seen in the world, that's the least of them. Okay, someone said that's the least of the problems they've seen in the real world. I would agree with that to a large degree. So... But that would be preferred, so you, you will have service C in the future, right? Yeah. So, right. Do you really want to pull this abstraction out when service C may come in? Right? But even if you leave the proxy here, you can just say, look, and you know, my result future actually, the type has changed. It's not a variant anymore. It's just the future, and when I send, just send it. All right? Decommission. Now, if you want to go the whole hog and just rip this abstraction out completely, you can do, which just means you rename the types from service proxy to service B, and hopefully name the variable from proxy to service B, but you're done. All right. And like I say, you've absorbed, think of the change we've absorbed here. We've absorbed like completely different responses coming back from something that goes through hundreds of parts of the code, right? Hundreds of files take this on. And we've managed to do this change and localize it into one spot and make the, the decommissioning risk free. The only risk of this is that someone comes along and says, well, you know, every full moon uh, an error happens that service B doesn't work, but you're going to handle that as regular production problems. You've probably had something like that anyway. So, how am I doing for time? Five. Five minutes, okay, I'm not too bad. So let me just tell you what the reality check, what's really going on, right? Because things are seldom as simple as they appear. I simplified some things down for this slide. So request A essentially had into it, not precisely, but essentially had a vector of request Bs in it, right? And what we were doing was sending it to this service, which was sending it on to the service beyond it. And that's why we had more hops, bad latency. And this thing wasn't that well designed. There was a lot of blocking going on, so it took a while to do. So uh, you got back a vector of responses. And this is not so bad if it's a single request B in your vector, but there are a bunch of batching operations where we take you know, a bunch of financial things and they gotta go through at the same time. This didn't work too well for that. And on the other side, you see request B was just a payload. And if you had um, a batch going on, you got a vector of futures back. All right. And you could say, hey, let me check are all those futures being satisfied. Now, because this was our world, it was our future, because okay, we were using, you can't use stud future puts to try to sleep. We had coroutines. So what we had was a way of just saying, if any one of these futures throw an exception, abort any of the other futures waiting so we could get a quick return. So these are optimizations that are, I could say not that interesting. So visually what was happening is request A was going in, it was routed to service A, it went in and a vector, a future with a vector of responses came back. On the other side, we had request B's sent out uh, like N mass. They all went to different server. They could, there was various instances of the service. You got a lot better throughput, but you got back, right? Potentially a vector of futures when you're doing, um, uh, when, when you're doing batch type operations. So what did we do? Well, by, well, let's look at the API, API use. At the very beginning, if you remember back, I wanted to get away from callbacks. I wanted not to be having people copy stuff all over the place. I didn't want to be doing my own memory management. So I channeled the good practices with the wrapper with the constraints. And that was everybody in my enterprise system had to live by this wrapper, right? So you couldn't slip in a sync call if you wanted to, which people will do because it's easier. But because I had these particular change requirements, I was able to take a broader view of what I was doing. It's not just getting something in, it's getting the other thing out. And by doing that, you see, instead of doing a lot of branching, which is kind of the knee-jerk reaction, we were able to do a more elegant solution, which meant we were more able to absorb change in a, in a better way. So what is the end game of all this? Why am I up here talking to you guys? Well, we should have a better delivery of change, right? We shouldn't have, I don't know, the roll forward, roll back model where we sort of get it wrong a lot of times, we go back and forth, right? We should be mitigating production risk with better engineering practices. Okay, and that is the message here. All right, thank you. I have all of this mocked, I can't actually put the, obviously, the Bloomberg code up, but I have all this mocked out. If you want to take a look at it, you want to, I don't know, come, come catch me later, try and take me down in a technical fight over how I did this thing. It's all up here. 
And I don't know if we have any time for questions, but does anybody get any questions? All right, well, thank you very much.